happen again, by the way, something terrible will happen and drain the stock market again. And we have to continue to remember that what tends to work doesn't necessarily indicate the future, but we want to focus on those kinds of things because that will be what helps us. If you would have panic sold everything that you had on March 13th of this year or March 12th, you would have missed out on a complete rebound less than a year later. Something to consider. All right, let's jump into room for error. Whoopsies. Room for error. You know, making you guys like move your uh, move your boxes with everyone's faces and chat boxes all over the place here. I apologize for that. I'm doing the same thing. Room for error. There is a uh, something we call a margin of safety. Um, and, and Morgan, uh, the author, talked a lot about this. In the interest of time, I'm just going to read what he actually put in there. And that's that room for error is the same as margin of safety. It's it, it it's the only effective way to safely navigate a world that's that's covered by um, that's governed by odds, should I say? And I'm going to share with you what that kind of an example of that uh, blackjack and poker players, for an example, um, they're dealing in probabilities, not certainties, right? So they know the odds that a card is going to be a certain card or an odd that they're going to win if they play a certain strategy in blackjack or poker, but they don't actually know that they're going to win. They don't know that the person on the other side doesn't have a 21 in blackjack or has pocket aces in the case of poker, but they don't know that for sure. But they know that if they play long enough, certain odds come into play and they leave a margin for error. Um, I don't know if she's still watching this, but in our many, many family reunion trips that have been in Vegas and New Orleans, I've sat at blackjack tables next to Julia and she's notoriously good at this, creating room for error. Whenever she wins her first hand at, at blackjack, she pulls all her winnings and puts them in her purse. She leaves a room for error that if the next three hands are all bad, she still has money that she's walking away with. In the case of, of business and in our personal wealth, we need to have that same conversation with ourselves. We need to make sure that we're doing the same thing. We need to, <laughs> Natalie, I do the same thing. I got to tell you, it drives me crazy, but I've, I've watched it. I've watched her do it a, a bunch of times and you, you know, you can call it creating room for error or margin of safety. And it's very important to building wealth. We don't want to put it all on black or we don't want to put it all on a specific uh, you know, hand in, in cards. Or in this case, we don't wanna put all our money on one crazy stock investment that we heard about you know, from our, our buddy at the golf course. Um, you know, this is a bit of a morbid thing, but he said it and I really, um, you know, I, it really stood out to me. He said, look, the odds are in your favor when you're playing Russian roulette, but the potential downside isn't worth the upside. So why would you ever do that? There's no margin for safety that could compensate for the risk of playing a game with you know one bullet in the gun, right? So you would never do that, right? That's a that would be a dumb idea. That's gambling with your life. You wouldn't do that. Treat your wealth the same way. Make sure that there's there is a, a margin for safety that says, hey, if this thing gets screwed up, I'm still going to walk out of this and be okay, right? Whatever that means to you. Uh, and and the term that he uses a lot in there was creating rainy day funds. Um, creating rainy day funds was a, a term that, uh, that, that he said. You know, have something set aside in the event that that things don't go well. All right, doing great. We're nearing the end, nearing the live discussions and whoever wants to hang here. Understand that we will change. Understand that we will change. Um, and I thought about this a lot, you know, again, I keep going back and, you know, the folks that I've been in business with at Keller for a long time, um, you know, we, we've, uh, some of you have known me since I had a lot more hair on this dome. And, uh, you know, I've known a lot of, of you guys since you were living a couple of houses ago. And, you know, of course, we all still have the same photos on our business cards. But, you know, other than that, time has definitely changed a lot of us. But it's funny, we look back and we see all this change, right? You know, when I, when I asked, I said, what do you suppose happened over the you know, past 13 years? People like kids and, and, you know, family expansions and relocations and blah, 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 all that stuff, right? The torn ACLs, which killed football out of my life, all those things. We look back and we see all these changes. Sometimes we don't even recognize ourselves. But when we look forward, we don't anticipate that we're gonna change more. Think about that. We look back and see all the changes, but when we look forward, we have no anticipation for whatever reason that we're gonna change more. And we make long-term plans and decisions with the idea in mind that how we are today is how we're always going to be. That what matters to us today might be completely inconsequential in a decade is, is irrelevant to us. We don't think about it at all. So I want to share that, that thought with you. I remember about 10 years ago or eight years ago, I had on my, on my list of things that I wanted to do in my life was I needed to buy a vacation home in Orlando, Florida. Why would I want that in Orlando, Florida? Go ahead and blow it up in the chat box. Why did I want a vacation home in Orlando? Most of you kids should hopefully know the answer to this. 
Disney, absolutely, right? I was at Disney and golf. Okay, fair enough, passing. I suppose, assume that's you, Mike. Yeah, Disney, right? I thought, yeah, I'm absolutely going to want that. I'm, why would I ever not want a home in Disney World? Well, my kids are eight and 10 now. I mean, Disney World's still cool, but not cool enough to go like live there part of the year. Not that cool, right? But it's amazing that in that point in my life, thankfully I didn't pull the trigger, but I, I was thinking like that would never change. What matters to me right now will always matter to me just as much as it does right now. And understand that we make a lot of investments toward that stuff. Some people do buy houses like that, or they buy you know, the car that they had to have, or they get into golf because they always wanted to join a country club or blah, 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 whatever it is. Those are anchoring decisions to past efforts that can't be refunded. So what that means is that you, know, you make decisions today for your future self, that your future self might look back at you and be like, you dumb, dumb, you didn't need all that, right? I mean, I look at it, real estate. I remember uh, in 2010, there was this big movement that everyone in real estate was going to wear like suits and ties to work every single day. And I bought custom suits and I got a wardrobe full of Robert Graham shirts. And the irony is, is now we're a tech industry and, and I can't, you know, most people I'm asking them to wear jeans to work and not their, uh, their, their dress sweats, right? Like how much that's, cra how much that's crazy changed um, is, is unreal. But we make decisions for ourselves at that point in time. We're making that decision for our future self. And that decision that we make, whether it's suits, vacation homes, or just not saving money because we thought we needed it to be spent on something else right now, we're making those decisions for our future self. And candidly, that's kind of the equivalent of a stranger doing that for us. Um, you know, we don't consider how often our desires will change. And that was something that uh, was really interesting um, as I was going through this book. Nothing is free. Nothing is free. Um, Purposeful investment, investing costs us money. It costs us joy uh, in the short run, potentially to find a benefit in the long run. So yeah, nothing is free. Um, to, you know, you, some of you have been outstanding uh, sharing in the, in the chat box, being very personal, and I appreciate that. You know, There are things that we have to go without to save. And everyone, from the people earning millions of dollars a year to the folks that are trying to earn 50, if you're going to save money, you're giving up something else. You're choosing to put money aside and you're saying, I'm not going to do with that, whether that's private jet trips or, or fancy cars or whatever, or, or maybe maybe it's going out to a restaurant once a week and going every other week instead in the money you were, would have spent from going out once a week, you put aside, whatever it is, we might be sacrificing, right? Nothing is free. You are giving up something to put that money aside for yourself. And the price of that success is this, it's uncertainty, it's regret. You might be feeling bad about things that we're not doing. In the examples I just gave, it's doubt, it's volatility. You know, think about the stress that it caused you. All of you who said I had money in the stock market in March. Some of you might've had like full retirement accounts completely invested in March. I can't imagine what that must've felt like. Um, but that's one of the, the costs of building wealth is uncertainty, is volatility. And listen, all of that stuff for the many of you like, like me who, who weren't super heavily invested, all that stuff is so easy to overlook like we could do right now until it's happening to us until it's happening to us. So it's important to consider this, that, that this will happen to you. If you put money into, the, into a market, if you put money aside, you invest into mutual funds, annuities, whatever it is, things are gonna go up and down. You're gonna have to do without in the short run. And that sounds super easy to hear me say right now until it's you that has to do it. Until it's you that suddenly has to look at the menu prices again, when you've spent the last five years living high off the hog. All right, let me slide this over here this to myself. All right, you and me, we are different. Um, kind of wrapping up here a little bit, but uh, it's hard to grasp that other business investors have different goals than we do because of an anchor of psychology is not realizing that rational people can see the world through a different lens than our own. Let me di explain what that actually says. And it's really important because some of us here, you know, there's uh, almost 40 of us in this group, I think right now, 36 people talking and, and, and learning together. We might be having side chats, texting each other, having conversations right now saying, oh my gosh, boy, I should have put all my money on so, such and such a stock, or I should have done this, or I should have done that, or I should have consolidated my team, or made a merger, or, or hired an admin. Understand that everyone sees things differently. That's an important reality to understand. Now, you might align with somebody really, really well, and that's good for you. That might be a good, the formation of a good partnership, but understand that you and me might see the world differently. We might have different risk tolerances. So what was great for me you know, I tell everybody who's, who's laughed, I'll share it all with you. On March 14th, I looked at the stock market and I said, 
this just can't stay like this forever. There's no way people are going to stop driving cars, flying airplanes, going on cruises, gambling. All those things are going to eventually come back. And I put $40,000 into the stock market on like March, whatever the first Monday after they shut down the world was. That money has tripled in 11 months. Tripled, literally. It was a, it was a hilarious experiment. But I was doing that kind of for fun. I, I'm not a very well-invested person. So I saw that and I was like, wow, that worked great. If only I could repeat that every year. That was outstanding. This pandemic was wonderful for my my bank, but understand there were some people who had all that money in there already, lost it all, and they were just desperately trying to get it back. So the exact same experience, the exact same days, the exact same set of circumstances was completely different for somebody who had a million dollars in the market that day versus someone who had 5,000 like me. I just not heavily invested in stocks and bonds. I never was until that day, until after it happened, right? So that's something that, you know, understand you and me are different. We might all see, and, and all of us might see the world through different lenses. And we have to understand that when people are giving advice, whether it's the author of this book, whether it's me, whether it's whoever your trusted advisors are, they might try to tell you, you need to do this, this, or this. And they might see the world totally differently than you do. You know, I need a high level of financial security. I grew up in a very volatile financial situation. My father was a auto parts salesperson when I was growing up. My grandmother was running a restaurant, you know, so we, we didn't have a high level of income security or predictability. Um, you know, especially in a time where certain car makers were putting, you know, million mile warranties on their cars. My dad's industry was under threat all the time. And he was a salesperson nonetheless, right? So for me, financial security is an incredibly high priority. But for some of the folks on here, I don't know if Matt Chase is still uh, checked in and, and, uh, and playing around here. There's, there's people like Matt who's like, you know, I joke with him all the time. He doesn't see, never hasn't seen an investment he doesn't like, right? Like there, but that's, that's different, right? We all have different experiences right? You could be very similar to someone and see the world through a completely different lens. All right, let's talk about pessimism a little bit. This is just something I wanted to share because um, I thought Danielle Sullivan might be listening and I know she hates pessimism. So pessimism isn't just more common than optimism out there, okay? I'm looking at all my skeptics here. I can see all your faces right now. So pessimism isn't just more common than optimism. It actually also sounds smarter. Um, and sometimes people say, I'm not being pessimistic, I'm being realistic, right? It's intellectually captivating. It it's, gets more attention paid to it. Um, it's, it's, uh, and by the way, optimistic people, optimistic people are often considered to be oblivious to risk. They think everything's always going to work for them. They're just oblivious that there's any possibility things are going to go wrong. If you tell someone that everything's going to be fine, right? They're more likely to shrug you off and offer you a skeptical eye and go, okay, everything's going to be fine, Scott. The market just crashed today. Everything's going to be fine. But if you tell someone they're in danger, oh my gosh, the market, the world, this pandemic may never end. I don't know what's going to happen. The markets are never going to bounce back from this. And oh my gosh, the president, and oh my gosh, the, the international blah, 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 all that stuff. You sound intelligent. You, you send signals to people that you are, you're aware, right? So pessimism is a, is a very present, um, it's very present for, for us. Like we react to pessimism a lot stronger than we do optimism. So I want to share with you just a little something from the book that stood out to me um, as we as we near the end of the uh, of the uh, the non book book club. Is that pessimists often extrapolate present trends without accounting for adaptation. In other words, they think that what's happening now, or they speak like what's happening now, will be happening forever. Candidly, they underestimate all of us, all of you. They they don't consider that we are experts at adapting. Uh, Andrew Ginter, I don't know if he's still on here, if he's you know, fully engaged. If he is, I'm going to have him comment. But you know, in 2007, you know, the market started to, to go bad. In 2008, it really started to go bad. In 2009, we started saying, oh, shit. By 2010 and 11, we're like, this is actually the worst market we've ever seen. Did every realtor go broke? No. In 2011, we learned about short sales. We learned about how to sell REOs. We learned about being more efficient with our time. We learned how to find buyers in creative ways because buyers were the, I can't believe I'm admitting this was a real thing, guys. 10 years ago, it was better to have a buyer than a listing because listings would sit on the market for like years at a time. And buyers had all the options in the world. They could make lowball offers. They could prey on it and wait. They could do all kinds of things. So it was actually better to have buyers than it was listings. Um, you know, at that time, a decade ago, people adapted and realtors still made money. Many of the realtors who were who were in the business in 2001 and had reached pinnacles of success um, are the same realtors that are in the top of the, the food chain in 2021. How did they survive that market? They didn't panic like pessimists. They adapted. They adapted and they kept the industry going. 
understand that pessimism, um, you know, that, that when we have, when we sense danger, it's, it's so much more of an experience for us, an opportunity. When we are afraid that we're going to lose something, we react strongly. Whereas when we see an opportunity, we sometimes can go, oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, threats incentivize solutions of equal magnitude. We talked about March 2020 already. Um, so I just wanted to share those things with you. That pessimism can be dangerous. It can stop us from, um, you know, from, from growth, from rebound, from, from building our futures and, and creating wealth and opportunity. All right. A couple other small things and then we'll, we'll move on and we'll have some conversation. There is a time when you will believe anything. Yes, even you can be caught believing anything is possible. Because the more you want something to be true, the more you'll believe a story that overestimates the odds of it being true. So let me say that. The more you want something, the more you're going to believe and overestimate the odds that it's going to happen to you. There are times that we'll believe anything. Rather than accept what we don't know, what we do psychologically, again, I'm no doctor. I'm just reading a book that a doctor wrote, a PhD doctor. He said that rather than accept what we don't know, we tell ourselves stories to create a feeling of control during a time of uncertainty. Uh, in other words, we actively try to develop personal theories um, or, or fill in the blanks of how certain things happen because we as humans just don't wanna believe that things are out of our control. So we say, oh, that person must have had X happen or well, that person's only being successful because they are partnered up with so-and-so and that person retired and left them their whole book of business and that must be how it was. If we don't know the reality as humans, we tend to insert and create a reality for ourselves that explain why certain things happen. We actually lie to ourselves. Um, in hindsight, the ability to look back, right, is, is probably one of the biggest devils of this. It gives us the illusion that the world actually makes sense all the time and that we're in complete control of it, even when it doesn't make sense. And there was just some randomness to it. Um, you know, I had a friend call me the day after Christmas, I think, and he said, I want to buy this commercial property. I want to close on it in three days. I want to pay cash for this commercial property that I'm closing on in three days. I think it was a Sunday morning when he called me. I just said, all right, sounds good. I'll handle that for you. And in three days we closed. That was completely random, but there was as much commission on that deal as, as some of our agents would earn in an entire year. And all I did was wake up that day and answer the phone from a friend who I didn't even know was calling me about that property. I thought he was calling me about something else like the Browns in the playoffs or something like a normal person, but that's what he did. So understand that we will create stories, though, to justify how those certain things happen to other people, but not us, or why those things happened and so forth. So I want us to understand that we, we, we tend to create lies to ourselves when we, when we think about how to explain certain things that are happening around us. And, and we can convince ourselves candidly of almost anything. We, we study the past to forecast the future um, oftentimes, and we discount A, other people's skills, and B, luck. We discount luck, opportunity that lands right in our lap. All right, so let's get to the uh, the end of the line here. I just want to summarize this a little bit. So here are some of the things that if you're if you want to go back, check your notes and do some, uh, um, you know, some kind of research what we what we talked about today in this non book book club. It would be these buzzwords: humility, humility, being able to live below your means and not caring what other people think not keeping up with the Joneses, lowering your ego, lowering your ego it is, you know, I, uh, I think about this one all the time. I, some of you who know me well know that I, I refuse to buy new cars. All my cars I buy have 25 to 35,000 miles on them. I refuse to buy a new car. It's just, I, I can't do it, but there are, there are people who absolutely will drive nothing but a new car. They need the, they need the perception that they've got the newest, coolest thing. Lowering your ego is a key to getting wealthy. I know that. I know that part for sure. Wealthy versus rich wealthy versus rich. Rich can be attained very, very quickly, right? Wealth is something that only happens if we live below our means, put the money that we're saving aside, and let it grow over time. Peace of mind. This is understanding what it takes for us to feel comfortable with the fact that we are living or doing things that we are doing. So for me, I have to have, you know, because of I had financial insecurity for most of my life. For my first 30 years, I vowed that my next 30 won't be that way. I need to have a certain amount of money aside at all times just in case. It's just, it's a paranoia thing for me. I guess I am paranoid after all that. Who knew? The power of time value. Understand that Warren Buffett was not a great investor. He was just a good investor that's lived a really long time. And if you do that, we're going to show this on a compound interest calculator momentarily. Um, you can see how someone can become incredibly wealthy 
just by doing it for a long time. And some of you can look out right now, right now where you're at and say, I have X amount of years reasonably in front of me. I could start today. Understand that failure and risk um, often run hand in hand. You might fail when you put your money at risk, but when you're trying to accumulate wealth initially, you might have to have to create calculated risks to the best that you can. Freedom is control of your time. Frugality. I didn't have it. I don't probably still have it if I'm being honest with myself, but frugality is a thing. So we want to, you know, look at, uh, look up what frugality is in the dictionary, find out whose picture is there and mirror and match. Go and do likewise. We need to have a saving habit. We need to have a saving habit. We have all kinds of spending habits, right? I hear that all the time. What are your spending habits like? PNC Bank sends me, you know, last week a, a, line, a columned chart of where I spent all my money last year. I thought that was very nice. So I know where all my spending habits are. You know what they didn't account for? They didn't tell me one damn thing about my savings habits. What is your savings habit? Prepare to pay the price. That price might be doing without. That price might be passing on a expensive something that all your friends and family are doing, that that price might be, you know, not going to fancy dinners every single weekend, but prepare to pay the price if you're going to save and get wealthy. Understand what your margin of safety needs to be and avoid extremes. Avoid extremes. Don't put all your money on red. That's dumb to do in a casino. It's even dumber to do with your wealth. Do not put all of your money on one investment. And then figure out what game you're playing. Um, we didn't talk about this, but it's a great place to, to kind of end the formal book session. Um, and that's understand what game you're playing. Um, if there's one piece of advice I can give you, and those of you who have taken the business planning clinic have heard me give it all the time, don't let other people control what you're aiming for in life. Don't let other people control that. You know, you don't, just because somebody else or, you know, your society of friends is all living in a certain community or investing in certain pieces of jewelry or driving certain types of cars, whatever it is, don't let other people define what's important for you. Spend time alone with a piece of paper and write down the things that you want out of your life. Define your game. I remember when I defined mine, when I had that epiphany, it was the Laird Wynn Business Planning Clinic, when I realized that I like real estate enough to stay here and work with all of you and serve everybody as best I can, but that my life's career ambitions and dreams are really on the football field. I remember the day that I came to that epiphany. It shouldn't have been a shock, but it felt really good to come to that epiphany. And I realized that I was willing to give up an awful lot, an awful lot of, of fancy things that I could probably buy with the riches I'll earn to put money aside and be able to go and live that dream someday. That's my game. Define what your game is for you. Everyone's is going to be different and don't base your decisions off mine or hell, even the author of the book. Don't base your decisions off, off him either, but understand that what we want to make sure we do is we're aiming for something and we're playing our own game. All right. So that concludes. So let's, uh, so that concludes the formal part of our book club. Um, what I'd like to do is this. I have 25 minutes for anyone who wants to hang on. Uh, maybe 20. I have a hard and fast stop time at 11:59 because I have to uh, be on an interview here at uh, at 11 or excuse me at 10:59 because I have to be at an interview at 11. So what I'm going to do here is first off allow people to share some ahas, some things that they took away from here. And uh, Mike, you are if if you have to do this, you can allow people to unmute themselves if that's something you have to facilitate. But um, go ahead. I want you guys to share your ahas from the morning. Um, let's try to get three, four, five of those takeaways. And then what we'll do is we're going to move into two things. One is uh, the, com the conversation around compounding interest and uh, another thing on how to calculate your net worth, your personal financial statement. And these two things that we're going to do next um, for those who stay are completely actionable. Like you will, you will be able to jump on your computer or your phone and do exactly what I'm doing at the same time I'm doing it. And boy, they can be really eye-opening. So let's get a couple of ahas first so I can take a sip of my G0 and uh, let's, uh, let's hear what we, what we all learned today. I'll tell you what, Mike, I'm going to stop my share too, so we can go into gallery mode. Nice. Uh, I'll share, I'll share my first aha. Um, and it was one of the first things you said that it, you know, we want finances to be this, this cold and hard science, but it's more behavioral psychology than it is physics. Right. Uh, and so understanding that allows you to change that that starts the process of changing the way you think about it. Yeah. Who else? You guys can unmute yourselves and share. You don't have to write it in the thing. <laughs> For me, um, hello. Yeah, we got you. We hear you, Carol. Okay. For me, the aha is just learning to save more. And you know, most of the things that you find, you feel, you know, spending money 
thinking that you need and you really don't. It's just, you have the money to spend it. So you just do out of habit. So, you know, and it's interesting we having this conversation because I've always had an IRA and um, I had stopped every month letting money come out of my account, but I started it back like some time ago. So this is good. I'm glad to hear that. Yep. You know, as, a, as an aside, you know, from those, from the folks who are, who are, you know, not personalizing anyone on this call, obviously, but I, uh, you know, I, I had my, my Facebook account hacked and deleted, you know, over the past uh, two weeks, it got hacked and I can't get back into it. Some of you have tried to friend my new account while I try to figure out if I'm going to keep it or not. And uh, one of the things that I remember from Facebook was I was a part of, I, I found myself a part of this like group of people who buys uh, cool clothes and cool shoes and all this stuff. Some guy spent $9,000 on a pair of Nike shoes, $9,000 on a pair of Nike shoes. I'm like, what in the God's creation is in those shoes that makes them worth $9,000? And I'm looking at like, it's like a 24 year old kid, like whole life ahead of him. He put that same $9,000 in the bank account. He could have bought the Nike factory by the time he turned 70, but you know, had to have the shoes right then and there. And it's just, it was really an interesting you know, enigma to me was or a question for me was really like, why do people do that? Um, why do they make decisions like that? So, so Carol, thank you for sharing the opposite, which is that, you know, you opened that IRA for some time and actually made the decision now actively to continue to use it again and ramp that up. That's awesome. What are some other ahas? Right. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I'm looking to have as soon as possible to do the um, contribute to my set. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and these retirement accounts that we're, we're talking about, you know, we're going to show what compounding interest is. For those who don't know what SEP is, it's a type of individual retirement account. The, we're going to show like what those contributions can look like and what that can mean for us over a period of time. It's actually really crazy. Um, and I'm going to show you a specific example. I know most of you on this are realtors. Um, I know we have some guests and some admins, but like for those of you who are realtors, I'm going to give you guys a real crazy sobering example. Um, uh, of how fast you can build wealth, believe it or not, if, you, if you're strategic. Give me one more aha. Who else has one? I saw some people unmuting. Hello? You got, Hi. You got it, Trina. Go ahead. Hey. Okay. So um, one thing for me is I'm consistent with savings, but I probably, based on everything that you said, I probably can just have uh, four less restaurant visits and make a big impact on my savings. But <laughs> yeah, right. I'll, I'll concentrate a little less on quality day to day but yeah. you know it's constant i have a system but it's definitely not enough so you know that is really a good aha is you know just that small amount when you're talking about just a year of what i do as far as yeah. <laughs> my quality of life at nice restaurants so yeah um, you know just little small things there's probably about as we you spoke about 10 little small things which will add up to a very big thing at the end of the day. <laughs> I looked at it, you know, and it was it was funny. It wasn't that I really loved going to fancy restaurants. I actually didn't go to them very often. I got an eight and a 10 year old, right? It was right. the convenience factor of having yep. someone else prepare a food for me. Yep. You know, just being able to say, oh yeah, I'm going to go over here. Like, it's amazing to me, the amount of money I spend on lunch at work. Right. I spend $20 sometimes just for me because I pay Panera to make two meals for me. And then I pay some guy to hop in a car and drive it to me. And then I pay... The right. service that employs the guy somehow, right. you know, from DoorDash or Uber Eats, I'm, I'm coming at like twenty-one dollars for me to eat lunch. Yep. I could have made myself that probably that exact same lunch for three dollars right. and forty-nine cents, and right. I'm doing it every single day. Right. Wild. <laughs> Two, three hundred. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you very I much. I appreciate it. So okay. I'm gonna get back I, into. I, I have an aha. Oh sure. Who is that? Polly. Polly. I got you. Hey, I just wanted to. This is kind of deep, but. Honestly, I come from a background that was just volatile with money all the time and volatile with uh, housing situations. And so for me, I literally my whole life rebelled. I married Bruce and I'm like, let's buy a house, let's buy a house, let's buy a house, let's buy a house. So poor Bruce has had 12 houses that we've lived in. And um, my mind shifted at some point and said, let's buy a house just for passive income. And I just started dabbling in that. And I feel like the psychology of money, uh, there was so many ahas for me for buying, I'm thinking buy and hold. I'm thinking, 
the bubble is in the market. I can actually sell something and, and literally take it to buy something else or put it away or give something to my children. So I'm just on that verge of passive income and it's working. And this made so much sense, sense to me to slow down and not think of spending. It's not about German cars for me. It's about how many houses can I own? That means, that means wealth to me because of the the volatile background I come from. Yeah. So this was very good. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that, Polly. Thank yeah. you. Go ahead, Cindy. Um, the, I've taken so many notes. I, I don't think I've ever <laughs> used my notes my whole life. Um, the thing that really, I think was a gift to me is to see how I can pay this forward as a gift to my adult children, to be honest with you. It's so interesting how just listening to all of this, these conversations, many of them have come up in my life with my adult children just recently, maybe in the past six months, and how, how respectful you have to be as you, get, as you get older and you have these adult children and all their big ideas and, uh, and opinions come in to play and how they can be very different from each other, guys. The siblings are very different. And this pandemic has really fragmented my family. My kids have gone two different ways and it has put a magnifying glass on the differences and how they believe in things. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they aren't talking. Yeah. So um, this particular <laughs> book, I believe may be the gift that I'm going to be able to give to both of my adult children and their spouses, because the spouses are usually the bigger problem. <laughs> they have differences that are then not a problem because I love them dearly, but they're now coming in with their baggage, right? right. They're coming in with their baggage and then it just mm -hmm. ah, gets bigger and bigger, <laughs> uh, exponentially just grows. So I just think that this is a great gift. I really appreciate you guys bringing this, this gift to us and something that we can definitely pay, you know, pay it forward yeah. to other, someone else. So I appreciate that a lot, Cindy. And we're going to, we'll make that our last aha because I want to share with you, I want to give you something you can bring forward um, literally here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again because this is something that, uh, again, it was a it was a big aha for me. Um, so hopefully you guys can adjust, you know, where the photos are and the blah, 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 do what you need to do here so you can see what what's uh, being shared here. But what I want you to consider here is that if you saved right now, and for some of you this is possible, for some it's not, but I just want you to think about the possibility that it could happen. If you saved $667 a month for 30 years, that would make you a half millionaire with the historical averages of investments, which is about 4%. So I know that doesn't sound like much, okay? And that sounds like a huge discipline because typically people who you know I'm talking to are like 660, where the hell am I gonna find $667 a month? Well, Satrina and I just located it in our diet. Mm -hmm. But um, you know that's a, that's a real thing. Where can we find $667 a month? If you can do that in 30 years, you'll be a half millionaire. I also want to throw something out there. And this is for all of us in our industries, the people we care about, the, whether it's, it's kids, first-time home buyers, or it's people who are just first-time home buyers in general, or people who have said, I don't have enough money, or I don't have enough time, or I don't have enough patience or understanding. Paying $15,000 a year into a mortgage, pay attention to this, versus paying that same $15,000 a year into rent, so that's $12.50 a month would get you another quarter million dollars of wealth. A quarter million dollars of wealth. Now, some of you might not have a quarter million dollars of wealth right now, period. Or maybe you've never even seen it. Or maybe you don't have a family member who even has that. Consider that if you just switched from renting to buying, that market rate for an average house in you know, Broadview Heights or Lyndhurst, $12.50 a month. If you just bought that house instead of rented it, you would create a quarter million dollars of wealth for yourself versus living in that exact same home as a renter. Isn't that cool for us as real estate agents? We get to experience that part of the book a little differently. You know, many of us know people, whether it's the, the person, you know, buying their first home or a person who just never thought they'd have one or whatever it is. And, and I wanted to share this with you, and I'm going to bring the calculator on the screen in a minute, but realtors, you know, going back to the first component here, the 667 a month, you guys have the opportunity right now to make a radical change radical change in your wealth in five years or less. Ready? Here it is. Put $50,000 a year away for five years. And don't say you can't do it. You absolutely can. You can absolutely make $50,000 extra a year. It might be tough in your first year. I know I've got some rookies on here. Yes, that's overwhelmingly to think about. Fine. 
get to where you need to be in year one and make the extra 50 grand in year two. But you absolutely can make $50,000 a year extra in real estate sales. I know it for sure because I can look around this call and see a bunch of you who have done it or just did it last year. You made $50,000 more than you needed. If you could do that for five years, just five years, and put that into the market, 30 years from now, you'll have over a million dollars. And you only have to save for five years. 50 grand a year for five years and just throw it in the market. Don't believe me here. I'll show you something. Ready? I'll pull this up and we can see exactly how this works. Let me share a different screen. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you guys can see my calculator. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to show you guys something right here. Initial investment. If you save that 50 grand a year, No monthly contributions thereafter because you want to go out and buy every fancy purse, piece of jewelry and watch there. You're just going to save for five years. That's it, period. I'm done. And you did it for 20 years. What would it become? Estimated interest rate, let's say it's 4%, which is about the average. We'll say there's a variable about one in there. And it's compounded uh, monthly. Calculate. If you did it, put 250 away, five years of saving, put 250 into an account on average, you'd end up with a half a million dollars. But look what happens if you can hang in there 10 more years. And I know we're all in different stages of our lives, but look at this. When you go from 10, 20 years of saving it to 30, boom, $828,000. You know what, I think I have to change that real quick. $829,000, $830,000. So I must've done 4.5%, which is the actual, hold on one sec guys, sorry. So what happens when you do front end estimation. There you go. Just a hair under a million bucks. Five years, $250,000 one time. One investment. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? And if you look at it too, by the way, full variance is $1.3 million. You know, if you look at the past 20 years, the appreciation in the markets is way more than four and a half percent. We're taking in like all the historical averages when we when we look at the 4.44 that uh, that uh, was consistent. So I share that with you guys because I just want to make it very clear that there's all kinds of, of options here. Here's another one. If your initial investment was $500 and you put in $250 a month for 30 years, what would that come out to? 200 grand roughly, 192,000 or Hell, it could be all the way up to 200, you'd be a quarter millionaire in the best case scenario with $250 a month. Guys, $250 a month is less than what people pay for their parking spots in Chicago when they work. Like there are places that we can carve $250 out realistically. And that's starting with nothing. That's starting with an initial investment of $500, which is usually the least you can put into to start an account with like an E-Trade or something like that. I'm just sharing this with you. I'm just sharing this with you because it is possible for us to amass wealth very quickly. And I keep coming back to this. What if we did, you know, what if we did 80,000 a year for four years, right? What would $320,000 look like with no monthly contributions thereafter over a 30 year period at 4%, $1.25 million. If you could make 80 grand a year for four years extra and throw it in an account, think about this. So Nancy Emmerman's here with us. Marty might presumably be hiding somewhere in the background. They make some extra profit share this year. I know because I get to see they made way more profit share this year than they did the year before. What if instead of spending it all on Marty's softball addiction, what if they took that same amount of money, threw it into an account? What kind of wealth could they build, whether that's for themselves or even for their legacy, for their family to leave, to leave someday? 30 years from now, if that money was put into a trust, that 320,000, the extra 80 grand for four years straight, if that was put into a trust that said, hey, do not touch for 30 years, that's what it would be worth on average, $1.25 million based on the historical trends. Pretty cool. It's a pretty cool thing to share. And, and I wanted to share it with you because I'm no stock expert. I don't understand any of this stuff, you know, ordinarily. It's, it's things that I, I had to learn. All right, we're gonna share screen, one more slide and then we're out of here. And the last thing to put out there is understanding what personal financials are. So understanding a, uh, your net worth or a personal financial statement. I wanted to potentially take you through one, but we're not going to do that because I found that that would have actually been a little too cumbersome and potentially too personal for whoever my unfortunate volunteer would have been. But what I want you to do is, is, is you know, for those of you who are taking notes, I know Cindy and Polly's and, and Jade, I can see furiously taking notes and Art, you know, 
write, write these things down and come back to it later, or you can just Google search personal financial statement or net worth calculator, and you'll find a lot of free sites that give you templates. So the first thing you have to understand is that you have, oh, go ahead, Mike, did you wanna throw something on that? Yeah, I just wanted, uh, and I'll plug this again at the end, on March uh, 12th, we will be having our first Money Matters Mastermind. Uh-huh. And so we will be uh, going over uh, creating a PL for your business and a personal financial statement. Uh, and anyone who wants to get a head start on that, um, in April of this year, I will hit five years of tracking on a weekly basis what my net worth is. Uh, and so it's something that I'm very passionate about, uh, along with other things related to spreadsheet and finance. But March 12th, put it on your calendar. We are going to be doing a session for this on your business and your and your personal uh, income or net worth. Thank you, Mike. So I'm going to spotlight myself here and actually stop sharing. So hopefully you guys can see when the spotlight, you can see my dry erase board. Give me a quick thumbs up if you can see that. Okay, good, perfect. All right, assets. What you want to do is itemize your assets. So what are the things that you own that don't like own you back? So in other words, like some people would say that their car is an asset. My car is going to be leaving at 12 o'clock today to go get a a cracked rim repaired for the third time in, in as many months. So is that really an asset or is it just a pain in the butt? It's probably a pain in the butt. I wouldn't, you know, I'll, I'll count it to the extent that it's still got some non-depreciated value. But the reality is a car is not like ideally what you're looking for here. You can put it on, but you're looking at more like things like your house. Okay. So asset one, if you're a homeowner, is typically a house, any property that you own. The second thing would be money in your accounts. So any money that you have in your savings accounts, in your investment accounts, in your checking accounts, in your 529 plans for your kids, that's all assets that belong to you. You might say, hey, I own my car. I paid cash for my car. I know that if I had to sell it today, it'd still be worth $35,000. So you can put your car on there to the extent that it's not, you know, a car that's costing you more money than it's worth. Okay. So you might put your car on there. You would put anything that you own, that you have ownership of, that has value if you were to turn around and sell it goes under assets. Okay. There's a lot more examples, but I'm just going to give this to you you know, simply, simply spoken, but like there are people who would amortize the value of their ownership in a company and things like that. Definitely put that on there. That's a huge part of my net worth is my ownership of our company, but that's not, um, that's a deeper discussion. Then you subtract out your debt. Okay. Now your debt is not the same as your mortgage payment. Okay. Everyone I know in our company has the ability to do a profit and loss statement because we talk about that more frequently in agent financials. We talk about it in the ALC and the finance committee. It's like, how much money did I bring in this year? How much did I spend? What was left over? I know we know how to do profit and loss statements or it's easy to find that. This is a little deeper. This is debts. So typically our debts are tied to the same house that we own. We owe a debt on, right? So you would subtract out your mortgage or mortgages. You would subtract out what you owe on your car, your balance. If you have a balance on your car, You subtract out whatever your credit card balances are. Now, listen, this is very different than minimum payments. You would subtract out the balance that you owe. Some of us have been carrying credit cards for for 10 years. I've been there and we paid the minimum balances just to get by for a while. But that's a real thing. And I know that that's real for some of us. I'm not pointing fingers or anything like that. But that is something we have to consider is that, you know, we have credit card balances. Okay, so CR card balances. Student loans. Student loans, unless I missed something, I think we still have to pay our student loans. So the balance that you owe on your student loans is something that has to be out there. And any loans that you have against your, um, any loans that you have against other, other parts of yourself. So whether that's, I borrowed money against my 401k or my you know, whole life insurance policy, whatever, would go under, under your, your liabilities or your debts, okay? What you end with, is your net worth. And I realize this is super simplistic. I'm giving this to you guys in like the most generic way possible. But let's use a real example. Let's see if I have another marker color, I do. We're gonna use a real example up here. And then I'll take some time for some questions on either of these topics, compounding uh, wealth or personal financial statements. If you have a house and that house is worth $250,000, 
and you have money in the bank, you've got $8,000 that you saved up. Then you've got a car, and if you were to sell that car today, turn it into the dealer, it would be worth 20 grand. Then your total assets, notwithstanding things like life insurance, HSAs, whatever, uh, is $278,000 in assets, okay? So we're gonna put 278K here, all right? And your mortgage, you put 20% down in your home. You've been living there for like three and a half, four years. So your mortgage balance is at 175, just to keep it simple. And the balance on your car, you've been driving the same car for like three years. So you only owe $6,000 on this thing. And your credit card balances, you know, you Christmas came and the holidays came or the holidays or whatever we call them now. And uh, the holidays happened and we charged all our stuff. So we got our holiday uh, on our credit card still. So we've got $3,000 in credit card debt. And student loans, they still haven't forgiven them. We still owe 10 grand there. Okay. 175 and six and three, 184, 194. So we've got 194,000 in debt. Okay. 278 in assets, 194 in debt. That comes out to 80. 84,000? Yeah. That comes out to a net worth of $84,000. Meaning if you cashed in everything, sold it all off, market value for the house, paying off all the loans, you'd have a net worth of $84,000. Now, the interesting thing about this is this. That's a snapshot of today. That's just how you are today, okay? It's amazing as an aside, how lucky we are to be in, in the many of us to be in sales commission jobs in real estate, because we have the ability to impact our net worth so dramatically in such a quick fashion. One good year where you don't overspend it and don't go blow it all on a bunch of stuff to change your quality of life. And you can change your net worth by literally hundreds of thousands of dollars very quickly. I've watched it. I've seen agents who have experienced it candidly, you know, doing a, a personal financial statement every couple of months, every quarter at a minimum. You know, I've watched them go, oh my God, what the heck just happened, right? But it's crazy. In our industry, we can actually double, triple, quadruple our net worth in a shorter period of time than most people who have a nine to five job where they're just plugging and playing and getting a salary that exceeds their, their life's expenses, barely. We have an opportunity and we can seize that opportunity here. So I just wanted you to understand how this works, right? 278,000 in assets minus X amount of debts if you pay them all off tomorrow is your net worth. And there are, you know, don't get caught up in, in this exact model. I made it simple purposefully because many of you are hearing about this for the first time ever. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to crowd it. So I've got about five minutes left. We've got some questions. I see Carol's got her hand up, I think. Let's see if that's purposeful. Carol, I'll let you unmute yourself if you want. That was an accident. Sorry. Oh, that's a, <laughs> mute you right back up. Who else? Uh, who, who might have a question, thought, epiphany, yeah, aha? Kind of go on top of what you said about all that. We as a company are committed to helping our agents do this. And so we see a lot of different ways that agents will protect their money from themselves. Uh, so if you had four different bank accounts and you wanted your commission to be split amongst those four different bank accounts and one to get your, you know, $5,000 a month for investing one for your 30% for taxes. And then whatever's left over is what you get to, to live off of. Like we can, uh, you know, I'll speak for Carrie and Julia cause I can't do it. Uh, we can divide that up. Right. Cause sometimes when the $5,000 commission check hits your account, it takes some willpower to push that around to the different places where your money should go. Uh, and so if we can help clear the path for you in any way, we'll be talking about that as a part of our, our monthly money masterminds uh, to make sure that you know everything that we can do to help you on your journey towards wealth. Well put. Tiffany says, what if we don't have 30 years for the compound interest to accrue? Is it still worth the investment? Absolutely. Look, time is a... Um, Time is one factor, okay? But there are strategies, and if you speak with a financial planner, they will help you get into more aggressive strategies if your goal is to get to a certain amount, if your goal is to be stable over the period of time that, you, that you've got allotted for yourself, whatever that investment timeline is. Um, Mike just put something in there that's funny but true. The best time to invest was 50 years ago. The second best time is today. Um, the only thing that you know, I know that's pretty consistent amongst all 
platforms is people say, don't go into high risk investments if you think you're gonna need to pull it out very quickly. That's, uh, that's something you wouldn't wanna do because you know volatility. Um, you know, I have a favorite stock, Carvana. I love, invest, I love my investment in Carvana, but it goes up 30 and 40 points or down 30 and 40 points every single day. If I needed to pull that money out on a day where it went down 30 points, that would be a problem. Um, other questions, thoughts, epiphanies, ahas? We got about two minutes. I have an aha. Go ahead, Carol. Now, this, this is not a question, so my yep. raised hand, but it's interesting. It's good to know, and thanks for this. And I, I saw the email, but I, I didn't know it was this uh, conversation was going on this morning. Uh, I was at home doing yoga, and Satrina texted me. <laughs> so, uh, like, I had to. I had to leave my yoga class because this was so important. Anything I, I'm always looking and learning and eager to learn how to save because I have less years in front of me than I do behind. I, you know, based on my age, and and I have grandchildren and great grandchildren. So that's my plan: is how can I leave a legacy for them and teach them about money growing up my mom was a single mom my dad died when i was very young so i just watched her work and take very good care of us so we the money talk wasn't held so to learn it and continue to learn it as i did over 10 years ago and invested into ira and i always was interested in stocks so i just kind of self-taught myself um, so I'm really, you know, it was when she texted me, I was glad and I'm appreciated of this and to continue to learn more. And that's what I've been doing is having um, Carrie split my check because I'm not that disciplined, you know, to, that, to um, do it. And having our, it, so. our assistant MCA is splitting uh, Carol's commission checks and, and designating some of it toward retirement or savings, right, Carol? Yeah. That's that's a huge, you know, we, we can do that. Like our, our we're here to support our, our agents and getting wealthier, building great businesses. And, and that's all a part of it. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. Right. I have to step off because I have to interview a candidate for a position, but thank you. Um, I'm not the person uh, on the, if any of you guys wanted to hang out and talk, I think you still can, but, um, but I'm going to have to jump off. So thank you very much for coming. And um, if and when we do this again, uh, tell your friends and uh, let's have a great, uh, let's have a great rest or weekend and a, a great, uh, let's put this stuff to good use. Let's make it happen. Goodbye, everybody.